Hello everyone, uh, a very warm welcome to those that have joined already. Uh, we are expecting a few hundred attendees um, from several countries today, so we'll wait a, a, few, a few more seconds, um, up to a minute for others to join and settle in. And in that time, I'll just run through some housekeeping uh, before we kick things off. So to start with, you'll notice that your lines are muted and your cameras are turned off. Um, ours are also off to minimise any technical disruptions and to allow you as the audience um, to focus on the presentation slides. On screen, you should also notice a control panel where you can submit any questions that you might have and, and we'll try and get through as many of them in the Q&A section at the end. Um, so with that, I see we're now at over 100 attendees already um, on the call from different organisations all over the world. So in the interest of respecting your time, let's make a start. Um, so the webinar today is part of uh, Convera's monthly webinar series this year to help organisations like yours keep abreast of uh, the variety of factors driving trends in, in global financial markets. And the focus for today's webinar is on the recent turmoil in the banking sector following the collapse of uh, Silicon Valley Bank last month. And we'll be providing insight linked to questions such as, are we at the start of a, a new global banking crisis? Um, how might the turmoil transmit to the real economy? Uh, and what impact has the stress had on, on the monetary policy and financial markets, specifically currency markets. Um, this is what we'll be covering in greater detail anyway, in a, in a holistic global overview um, from different perspectives around the world. As you can see, our speakers today include myself, I'm George, the UK macro and FX strategist. We have Boris, our macro strategist from Austria, and uh, Brendan, our hedging director from Canada. Um, Brendan should be joining us today, but he's currently experiencing a, a few technical difficulties um, but his section is the last, so hopefully he does manage to join us. So in terms of the agenda, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll hand over to Boris in just a second for an overview of the banking situation, the implications for the economy and the reaction from cent uh, central banks and governments and what to expect going forward. Then I'll take over once more, do a deep dive into the currency markets, the volatility that we've witnessed recently and the forecasts um, from a European and a North American perspective. And then hopefully Brendan will be able to wrap up the presentation with some guidance on risk management strategy. Um, before I do pass over to Boris, I just wanted to set the scene here um, because as we know, there was so much going on and so many developments from the economic and monetary and geopolitical landscape is challenging to cut through the noise and, and distinguish the key takeaways that businesses like yours need. So we try and make our reports as clear and concise as possible whilst not sacrificing important insights that's, that's required. So this page here provides a few key stats summarising our findings, such as the sharp shift in market expectations towards the Fed cutting interest rates, which sent the dollar lower last month, despite its safe haven status, which we usually see it appreciate during times of heightened market stress. And we also saw hikes from rate hikes from the uh, European Central Bank and the Bank of England, despite this instability in the banking sector. And we, we witnessed both the euro and the pound reach two month highs against the, the dollar last month. But that occurred just a fortnight after the dollar hit a three month high against a basket of currencies. So it's clear that volatility in the currency market continues to make it challenging for businesses trading internationally. And the swings in exchange rates have been a result of the elevated volatility um, in the macro space and particularly more recently, extreme fluctuations seen uh, in the bond markets and, and interest rate markets as a result of the stress in the banking system. So will it remain that the situation in the banking sector is, is more idiosyncratic than systemic, boosting global risk appetite, equities, the pound and the euro, or will the spillover effects into Europe start to heighten recession fears once more, force a global rethink on, on monetary policy and trigger risk, risk aversion and boost the US dollar. I'll hand you over to Boris now uh, for a deep dive into the macro and monetary implications of the banking turmoil and what to expect in the future. Over to you, Boris. Well, thank you very much, George, for the brilliant introduction. And of course, a warm welcome to everyone joining today's webinar as well from my side. So my whole objective for the next 10 to maybe 15 minutes is to basically lay out some of the key macroeconomic themes that have been driving financial markets, especially in the recent weeks. And to also lay the foundation for better understanding the effects side of things that George will be discussing afterwards. Because even though currencies are at their core, 
driven by these divergences, as, as George said, between monetary policy, politics, and the economic development of their respective regions. There are some big picture macro trends and themes that influence FX markets regardless of these regional specificities. And what I would like to do, especially in this section, is to look at one of these trends that has pretty much shaped financial markets the most in March, namely, as George mentioned, the banking crisis in the US and especially the response that followed by the US Central Bank. So turning to the first slide, to better understand the full scope of the situation and to try to give an outlook for the next three to let's say six months i've prepared three charts that should show us the topic from three different angles once from the commercial bank's perspective on the left from the fed's perspective in the middle and then from the side of the real economy on the right side we think at its core um, the banking turmoil has been about three specific things risk mismanagement at individual banks unrealized bond losses during 2022 and smaller regional banks in the US not being able to compete with interest rates at larger banks and especially money market funds. Focusing in on our first chart here on the left hand side, we can see that deposit growth at US banks had already started turning quite negative at the middle of last year. Normally, banks would sell some assets like, for example, government bonds to make sure to cover the withdrawal of these deposits in times of crisis or market turmoil. However, given that bonds had just recorded the worst year since the 1970s in the US, banks had been sitting on unrealized bond losses worth around 600 billion US dollars. So by selling these bonds, they would actually have to book and therefore realize these losses, which some of these banks couldn't or didn't want to do. And in the case of the collapsed Silicon Valley and Signature Bank, most of these bond exposure was not hedged, which made the situation even worse. And this is why banks started borrowing at the middle of last year, um, which is seen in the first chart in blue. Borrowing by US institutions, which are small or large banks, increased to 918 billion US dollars year on year. With the third week of March, which was kind of seen as the peak of this banking uncertainty and skepticism around this whole banking system, uh, borrowing jumped by around 500 billion US dollars, the fastest weekly pace on record going back 50 years. And from the Fed's perspective, seeing deposits falling and borrowing rising at these unprecedented levels uh, made the Fed step in to ease this liquidity stress in the banking system. And the Fed did this, which is important for us, by a two-step process. So firstly, um, the Fed introduced a new emergency lending facility called the Bank Term Funding Program, short BTFP, which basically lets banks borrow by putting in their government bonds at par, meaning at the initial instead of the current value of the bond. And second, the Fed expanded the conditions of its deposit window. In the second chart, we can see that the take up and the usage of these lending facilities has been above $150 billion three weeks in a row, meaning that the support has not only been appreciated by the commercial banks, but that the facilities have actually been used by the banks. This has, however, um, on the other side of things, also led once again to expansion of the Fed's balance sheet that we can see in red, and that is especially important for us on the FX side. Um, the Fed has been shrinking its balance sheet since the beginning of last year, which was a, a proactive move um, in addition to the rate hikes to fight this increase of inflation. But once again, with the usage of these emergency lending facilities, the Fed's balance sheet has been um, going higher in the last couple of weeks. And for markets, it has really raised the question if there truly is a trade-off between creating, first of all, security or, or uh, securing price stability on one hand and securing financial stability on the other, because one of them would need additional rate hikes, but the other would need additional uh, or even uh, the beginning of rate cuts. So this is kind of something that has been uh, questioned by investors in market in recent weeks. But still, for now, as a main conclusion, the Fed's emergency facilities appear to have worked because while deposits continued to fall and borrowing continued to rise last week, the pace has definitely slowed, which for us suggests that these pressures in the banking sec sector have been easing in the last couple of weeks. But again, this is something that we will definitely be watching 
going into April as the Fed is publishing this data on every Thursday and Friday. So the balance sheet and the borrowing data is published on Thursday and the deposit rate, uh, data is published on Friday. Another implication that we are watching very carefully is highlighted in our last chart on this slide. Because even though the short-term crisis has been contained by these quick responses by the Fed, as previously mentioned, um, which is also why a reason why, as George mentioned, equity have rallied, the US dollar has sold off in recent weeks, the increase of the usage of the Fed's discount window does point to banks tightening lending conditions in the future, especially on consumer and small business loans. And this for us is one of the most important questions investors are currently asking at this stage. Will lending standards tighten? And if so, will they actually substitute for the now priced out Fed hikes? Because if banks don't tighten conditions and infl if inflation continues to surprise to the upside, why should the Fed pause its tightening cycle how it is priced in right now in markets? And this is a conundrum or a question that we touch upon in the next slide. Because it's, it's precisely this uncertainty about the medium term implication of the banking turmoil on the economy, but especially on monetary policy, why fixed income volatility had risen to multi-decade highs in March. Granted, as I said previously, some of the stress has come off in the last couple of weeks with stocks once again rallying, but focusing on the right-hand side text in the upper corner, we currently see and describe in this case three reasons why volatility continues to be this elevated. So for us, the first point is that volatility at the beginning and the end of pretty much every policy cycle, be it a tightening or a cutting cycle, is always elevated just given the uncertainty about not only the direction that banks are headed, but also at which pace. Secondly, something that is quite unique to the current hiking cycle as we have it right now, there are a lot of opposing forces at play, which are increasing the difficulty of setting monetary policy for central banks. We have, for example, just to name a few, headline inflation falling versus rising core inflation. We have a falling goods versus rising services inflation, we have rents and shelter costs still rising versus the deflation in energy prices. And one thing that central banks are watching is we have a recession in the manufacturing sector in pretty much all of the developed world versus a still consistently resilient labor market and the consumer. And the former would always suggest rate cuts, while the latter would suggest rate hikes to continue basically putting central banks, as the saying goes, between a rock and a hard place. And it's very hard for central banks to set monetary policy while these diverging or opposing forces are at play. And lastly, the last thing I would like to mention is narratives are changing quite fast, as George mentioned in the beginning, because of all this macroeconomic volatility and because of the data dependence of central banks. Because the data dependence of policymakers means that every single data point, every single data release has the potential to turn the next rate decision in one or the other direction. One thing, however, that um, has changed permanently since the emergence of the banking crisis and that probably won't go away that easily has been markets basically pricing in the end of the tightening cycle for the Fed and even expecting three to four rate cuts before the end of the year. In our focus chart right here, we can um, see the expected difference in the policy rates between the ECB on one hand and the Fed on the other hand, meaning that if this line is above zero, markets expect the policy rate in the Eurozone to rise more aggressively than in the US in the next 12 and 24 months. And this is the highest divergence we have seen since the foundation of the Eurozone. So markets are really betting strongly on this policy change or policy shift from the Fed based on the assumption that A, inflation will be much stickier in other parts of the world than in the US, and B, that lending standards will tighten more in the US and therefore dragging down economic activity. And this is why, again, um, upcoming data will be so important to watch going forward. And this is why we can turn to the risk calendar on the next slide. Right, because again, gauging how likely these two assumptions are to play out with the Fed will basically tell us if market pricing is correct. We are still, um, for the month of April, we are missing rate decisions from the Fed, ECB and the Bank of England, um, of which all three have already increased interest rates last meeting. 
but central banks in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Japan are meetings which will pretty much set the tone for the big free rate decisions in May, especially after the Australian central bank decided to leave policy rates unchanged this morning. In addition to these rates expectations or rate decisions, inflation and labor market data will be closely watched as well. Both data points um, will be published for the UK, Eurozone, and the US. And given that markets are still undecided on whether these central banks will continue hiking rates or pausing the tightening, tightening cycle like in Australia or for example in Canada, this data will help convince markets of one way or the other. However, um, again, as I mentioned a couple of times during my presentation, we will be watching more carefully data on the global deposit and borrowing flows and any signs of lending conditions tightening. So on the next slide, in the right-hand corner, we have written in the first paragraph something that is, I feel like, very important, which is that inflation has been the sole driving force determining monetary policy for the last 12 months. But this has definitely now changed because central banks have become more aware of the negative impact of tighter monetary policy on the real economy and the financial sector and as i said have become more data dependent and so while inflation and labor market data will be extremely important going forward the real question for central banks will be again a if banks tighten lending conditions first of all b if the availability of loans especially for small businesses and consumers will continue to suffer again as we'll see in this chart and see if therefore the real economic activity starts turning south. Because if it does, central banks will not have the room to prolong the tightening cycle any further. But in the case that banks do turn the corner, if we have already seen the peak pessimism surrounding the banking sector, then rate hikes for the May and even June meetings will start becoming the consensus for the Bank of England, Fed and DCB. In our opinion, it will still be difficult to make the case for rate hikes beyond June, even in the scenario where, the, uh, where we don't get negative news on the banking front, just because of the expectations that lending conditions will tighten further in the next couple of quarters, and because leading indicators do suggest weaker growth for world trade and for the global economy. In the US, for example, um, both the ISM purchasing manager and the NFIB Small Business Survey, so two of the most important surveys that we have for the US economy, both point to negative jobs growth starting around the end of Q2, beginning of Q3. And as I said, um, hard data has really been resilient or even resisting uh, this deterioration of the survey or, or soft leading indicators. Um, but again, we are expecting that the weakness in this survey and soft leading indicators will turn into a weakness of the harder data. But even, this is something we, we still have to mention, even if we start seeing this expected economic weakness, it's still up for debate if the weakness of headline inflation and the weakness in economic activity will be enough to convince central banks to actually cut rates uh, again, given that core inflation rates will remain extremely elevated during this year. So I think with this big picture in mind, um, I would like to hand over to George, who will give us a, a closer look into the recent developments on FX markets. So back to you, George. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Boris. Plenty of valuable insight there, helping us understand how this banking crisis has impacted the economic and monetary policy outlook. So thanks again. Uh, my job now is to cut through all of this information and, and sort of highlight how currency markets have evolved over the past few months and, um, and more recently since the banking sector stress and what might unfold in the future using scenario based analysis. So firstly, um, some of the, the recent volatility we've witnessed in, in sterling denominated currency pairs is what I wanted to touch on first. This table provides the 30 day and year to date highs and lows. Uh, the size of the trading ranges of these time frames and the position of the currency pair within these ranges and on the table i've highlighted the pound versus the dollar and versus the euro because they're the most commonly traded in the uk and as you can see over the past 30 days we've seen just under a five percent trading range on sterling dollar and just over a five percent range since the start of the year and um, a low of around 118 and a high above 124 that's um, actually, that's uh, around 125 now, thanks to today's movements in, in sterling dollar. And if we think back to our uh, last webinar last month, uh, the pound was trading in the lower regions of these ranges, but now it's swung into the top end of, of, of both these ranges. 
as I said today, it's recorded a fresh 10-month high against the dollar. And this is mainly thanks to US interest rate expectations sharply reversing course like Boris has been talking about, and particularly so after the, the, the banking crisis was largely contained to the US. Um, but aside from the resilience of, of the UK banking sector and, the, and the, the narrowing of the interest rate differentials between the US and the UK, we've also had a, a better string of um, UK economic data lately, particularly the soft data um, by which I mean the consumer and business expectations, as an example, that have improved significantly. Um, granted, from from the press um, or significantly historically historically low levels, but still the improvement has helped drive the pound higher as well. And sticking with um, sterling dollar for the time being, if you look at the chart in the bottom right of this slide, um, you'll see that I'm calling out something else I mentioned in in our previous web webinar that was. Um, the, the, the sterling dollar exchange rate has never been below 130 for such a sustained period of time. Uh, and it was back in 1985 when the currency pair spent uh, 200 consecutive days under that 130 level and, and it recorded 23%, um, it, it recovered, sorry, 23% in four months to back above uh, that key 130 level. This time round, we've seen a 20% recovery in about five months. Um, but the upside seems to have stalled around to five cents short of 130 for now. And to repeat the same message I did last month, you know, this means any organizations that agreed long term contracts with 130 as the budget rate without a suitable heading strategy in place may still be feeling the pain of that sharp downturn of sterling dollar witness last year. Now, against the euro, volatility continues to be a bit more subdued in this currency pair, uh, a 3% trading range year to date and trading uh, slightly towards the top end of that range at the moment. And we think the, the lack of realized volatility in sterling euro really reflects the similarities of, of UK and, and European economies um, and their exposure or, or lack of exposure um, recently to the, to the banking crisis so far anyway. Um, but ultimately growth and, and interest rate differentials are key as always. Uh, and with the, the European Central Bank expected to raise rates more than the Bank of England this year, there is a slight negative bias for the future of, um, of sterling euro in the short term, but there's still little sign of a convincing breakout either to the upside or downside of the year to date trading range and the pound and euro should continue to move in tandem with one another. Overall, um, the pound was actually the best performing currency in the first quarter of this year, rising on average um, 3% against its G10 peers. So you know, good news for UK importers selling pounds and buying foreign currency. Not so good news for UK exporters selling foreign currency and buying pounds. However, if we take a step back and look at our value indicator analysis, um, it tells a slightly different story, or you can look at it in a slightly different way. So here we're showing where exchange rates are currently positioned relative to their long-term averages, which allows us to identify um, FX purchasing opportunities, but also risks um, from a wider lens. Then if you look at the, the top of the table, Sterling against the Australian dollar leads the pack with the pound at over 3% above its year-to-date average and over 4% above its two-year average. Again, because of um, the wavering economic growth fears and, and due to the expected um, tighter credit conditions um, hurting more risk-sensitive currencies such as the Aussie. Um, sterling versus the yen, that swung from the top to the bottom of this table and that's due to um, its weaker position relative to its year-to-date average. But if we zoom further out and look at the right hand side of that row of sterling yen at the bottom, you see the pound is still 8% above its five year average rate because interest rates remain at record lows in Japan, whilst the Bank of England has raised rates 11 times in a row now um, from 0.1% from to 4.25%. Um, so that interest rate differential is what's driven um, sterling yen as high as it has been over, over the past um, year or so. Against the US dollar, uh, the pound has moved higher, as I mentioned, since last month, making it positively positioned relative to its year-to-day and one-year average. But again, if you look over to the right-hand side of that row, uh, it's still around 5% below its two- and five-year averages. Um, now, if you look over to the, the chart on the bottom right of this slide, uh, once again, you, you see that the range of sterling dollar has been dropping for years, in fact, um, from around 140 to 170 before... Uh, the Brexit vote in 2016, uh, and then 120 to 140 for much of the time after that vote. And the annual average rate of uh, sterling dollar has also been falling 
as highlighted on the chart. So from 135 in, in 2016, uh, 128 in 2020, 124 last year, and um, so far this year, the average rate is about 121. So the main takeaway here is that despite the pound's recent recovery, we have to question um, you know, just how much further it could travel. And one way of looking at uh, its current position um, is that its sterling dollar is still well below its long-term averages. You know, companies selling dollars and buying pounds could view this um, still as an opportunity to potentially capitalize on via long-term hedging strategies. But you know, based on how the average rate has been falling for the past seven years, companies selling pounds, buying dollars, could also view the current levels as attractive, especially since we're trading near that 125 mark now. And this could prove to be um, near the top of a new trading range. So this is why when it comes to currency planning, all organizations are going to have different perspectives. And, and so our aim is to help businesses identify and assess the drivers of risks and opportunities to understand their own risk appetite and tolerance and then develop and implement some sort of risk mitigation strategy before evaluating that and, and trying to improve the outcomes. So with that, I'll move on to the forecast scenarios um, because these complement the first step in, in, in terms of identifying the sources and drivers of risks and opportunities when it comes to exchange rate developments. Now, we believe this scenario-based approach is, is more appropriate to safely navigate currency markets as opposed to trying to predict exactly where the exchange rate will end up over a certain time frame. So the left-hand side of, of this chart shows the historical exchange rate of sterling dollar and the right-hand side um, shows the different paths the exchange rate could take in the future based on certain events and trends unfolding. Um, it's created in partnership with Oxford Economics and the base case scenario and the high and low scenario are generated via an, an economic model using many variables like interest rate, growth and inflation differentials as, as examples here. Um, but from that baseline, we calculate one standard deviation above and below it to provide a more central scenario. So the, the gray shaded area in the middle, which via our calculations will cover 68.2% of the outcomes. So in layman's terms, there's a near 70% probability of the exchange rate falling within this range. And you may be thinking that the range um, still seems quite large uh, and a low of 115 to a high of 133 by year end is about a 16% range. But you know, if you consider we've seen sterling dollar move about 20% in five months, as I mentioned earlier, and last year we saw a, a full year trading range of about 30%, it does go to show that neither of these scenarios are actually that extreme. What I will note is since last month, in fact, for several months, the baseline forecast for sterling dollar has been quite stable, and that's due to the pound being heavily undervalued against the dollar according to Oxford Economics beer model. So we assume that the pound strengthens against the dollar over the forecast horizon, uh, and this will be helped by the Bank of England raising interest rates to 4.5% uh, to as, as expected um, in May. That's what markets are, are predicting anyway. It's, uh, been 50-50 for a while, but it's slightly leaning towards uh, another 25 basis point hike in May. Um, but the point is that the main point here is that um, the markets are expecting the Bank of England to hold rates higher for longer than the Fed, whereas the Fed are expected, uh, is expected to cut. And one reason for that is inflation in the UK is still in double digits, uh, a surprise uplift um, to 10.4% to from 10.1% in headline inflation last month. And, you know, even though the Bank of England is forecasting inflation to fall sharply this year, we and markets remain sceptical on anyone's ability to try and predict inflation right now. As Boris mentioned, we're seeing a lot of macro volatility. And by that, I mean, we're seeing um, upward and downward surprises um, to, to the consensus forecasts of, of where the, the economic data is going to come out. But either way, um, neither we or the markets expect the Bank of England, as I said, to, to cut rates like markets are pricing the Fed to do. And that's one of the main reasons why we see the upside potential for sterling dollar, though this could be gradual from here, given the sharp moves that we've witnessed over the past month or so. Um, of course, there is a downside scenario where we have to acknowledge the spillover effects from the banking crisis, triggering turmoil across Europe and the UK, tighter credit conditions, as Boris mentioned, raising fears of recession, causing uh, central banks to cut, including the Bank of England, and that could see sterling upside fade very quickly. Um, but the main takeaway from all of this is that no one really knows what the future holds. Perhaps that 125 is the new ceiling, as I mentioned, uh, the new ceiling of, of a new trading range for, for sterling dollar. Uh, 
So again, to reiterate, it all depends on the, these particular assumptions coming to fruition or not. Now, in the interest of time, uh, I won't cover in, in great detail the sterling euro um, forecast scenarios today, but the baseline forecasts remain stable at 114 um, through 2023, though its trajectory will largely be influenced by monetary policy divergences. And again, that's going to be driven by data unless the banking terminal becomes more systemic. Um, but as a reminder, you'll have access to all of these um, scenario-based forecasts via our Global FX Outlook report. Moving on to uh, the North American section, um, where we explore a bit, a bit more insight related to the US and Canadian dollars. But before we do, uh, I just want to note that we'll have a much deeper dive into this section, uh, in particular next month when our, our North American analyst returns. Um, for today, though, some light comments from me. And, and remember, again, you'll have access to these slides uh, and can discuss them further with your account management and corporate hedging managers if you wish. So the first one, uh, let's have a look at the volatility analysis slide once again, uh, where we see the biggest fluctuations this time um, in, in the dollar versus the Mexican peso, as you can see at the top of the table there. And also just below that, the dollar against the Japanese yen um, and the latter trading in the lower region of its 30-day and year-to-date ranges. And, and to repeat what I mentioned earlier, this huge demand for the Japanese yen that was triggered last month was due to risk aversion, inducing those safe haven flows um, after the collapse of, of, of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and, and the, the banking stress that we witnessed, um, sparking that, that demand for safe haven assets, which includes the traditional uh, Japanese yen. What's interesting um, for us, though, from this table, the stats related to the, the Canadian dollar, um, you know, the dollar suffered its own sell off um, as well as the US dollar, which is uh, the Canadian dollar suffered its own sell off as well as the, uh, the US dollar, which is why I've come, uh, called out Euro CAD on this particular table, uh, given it's moved into the top 15% of its 30 day and year to date ranges, as you can see. The reason why it's interesting is the weakness of the CAD probably has something to do with the Bank of Canada. Uh, recently decided to pause its rate hiking cycle, of course. Um, but when we looked at the charts, the CAD sell-off actually occurred at the same time as the US dollar sell-off during the height of the US banking stress. And this is largely unjustified, really, because the, the Canadian banking sector is entirely different uh, proposition. It's not nearly as fragmented, and the banks don't see the same degree of deposit volatility as, as we see in the US. And in fact, unlike those US banks, uh, Canadian banks have been um, considerable have seen considerable deposit growth over the past few years. So although it seems unfair, the CAD has suffered along with the, the US dollar last month. And the, the, the US dollar, Canadian dollar exchange rate itself was relatively muted compared to uh, European counterparts. But as I said, despite the, that pause of the, the Bank of Canada in its rate hiking cycle, once again, um, we, we saw the sharp recalibration of the, the Fed rate expectations lower meant that CAD ended up strengthening against the US dollar towards the end of the month. Um, before I move on to the forecast scenario slide of Euro against the US dollar, if you look at the bottom right um, of, this, of this slide here, um, I picked out the US dollar index versus the US Treasury volatility index. And the reason why I've included this here is to highlight the, the decoupling of the correlation that we'd usually witness, which is that um, more volatility in bond yields tends to um, spur US dollar demand. Um, but actually what we saw last month was the dollar depreciated amidst some of the most volatile price action in US treasuries in 40 odd years. And in fact, um, a lot of that was based on the, the two year treasury yield, which moves in step with interest rate expectations that slid over 50 basis points in just one day and actually endured uh, its biggest three day fall since 1987. So the reason why the dollar weakened despite this elevated volatility was largely because the dollar lost its yield, its yield advantage due to markets believing the Fed is going to cut interest rates substantially over the next couple of years. Again, as Boris has already highlighted. Now, moving on to uh, my final slide of today, which is uh, Euro US dollar forecast scenarios. You know, this is an integral currency pair. We watch it closely. It's the most traded currency pair in the world, so it has repercussions elsewhere. The Euro, like other currencies, have been profiting from falling US rates, as I mentioned, and increased speculations of rate cuts from the Fed. And the second positive factor has been 
um, US dollar liquidity, as Boris mentioned, the Fed is much more active in, in providing that liquidity and therefore implicitly increasing the supply of US dollars. And this supply has to be matched by increased demand for the dollar's value to remain stable. And so for that reason, we think the balance of risks are probably tilted towards a weaker dollar this year. But again, I want to reinforce that we don't profess to know exactly where the exchange rates are heading, but instead provide this scenario informed perspective like you can see here to help build that strategic insight. But that said, we do feel like there's an increasing upside bias developing when we look at um, the, the euro dollar exchange rate because of multiple uh, correlation charts as, such as inflation, interest rate differentials, all favoring the, uh, the euro over the dollar right now. And ultimately, the, this dramatic repricing of the Fed cycle has delivered a huge convergence in two year um, euro dollar swap differentials. So simply put, as Boris mentioned in his presentation, the, the European Central Bank is expected to out height the Fed this year, but the Fed is also expected to outcut the ECB over the next 12 and 24 months. And this is expected to drive euro dollar higher, which is one of the reasons why the baseline scenario of, um, of euro dollar trends higher, as you can see. But these forecasts also incorporate Oxford Economics' long term view of equilibrium exchange, which they estimate to be uh, around uh, 125. So this is used as a target for short-term FX forecasts to converge to. And in line with this, we think if the 110 resistance level on euro dollar breaks, then that 115 mark um, could be the target for this year. And that's the upper level of the central scenario, as you can see from the gray shaded area on this chart. But what might delay this move is the fact that we're at the end of this tightening cycle. Investors might feel a bit more fearful about stagflation risk and, and central bank over tightening. Um, than they are about relative yield differentials. And therefore, safe haven dollar demand could drag euro dollar to retest its year to date load near a 105 before it does try and test or, or climb back above that 110 mark. As ever, though, trying to draw a base case in, in, in such a noisy market environment isn't easy. And we have to be wary of extreme scenarios playing out as well, such as that banking contagion spread to, um, to, to European lenders increasing the, the chances of the, of the ECB also pausing, possibly cutting rates, which would of course weaken the euro's yield advantage and potentially drag euro dollar into that downside scenario range. You know, opposing forces are always in motion, as Boris mentioned, and for that reason, it's imperative to consider several scenarios to make sure that as a business, you're adequately positioned to take advantage of any favorable moves in exchange rates when they occur, as well as being protected in the, in the event of any adverse currency moves structuring for optionality and potentiality is key and that's what we advocate and believe is critical for sound planning and preparedness. Now I was going to hand over to Brendan um, for some more insights into risk management strategy but unfortunately it seems um, Brendan has been un unable to join us today so we won't be covering his section in today's presentation. Um, however once the recording is made um, and available for you uh, via email and via our website. We hope to include his section for you by then. So thank you for everyone um, for sticking with us so far. Um, as Brendan won't be pre presenting, we've got um, a few extra minutes left dedicated to Q&A. Um, so remember to submit any of your questions um, or any questions related to the content that we covered in your control panel, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. Um, I think we've got one early one come in already, and uh, I'll, I'll hand this one over to you, Boris. Give my voice a break. Um, the question is, when do we know if the banking crisis is over and how likely is a rate hike in May? Yeah, thanks, George. Good question, brilliant presentation. Um, yeah, given that we have a bit more time, I'll do a bit more of an in-depth explanation on, on the issue because I feel like given its weight on the future development of markets i feel like this is one of the most important topics as i already mentioned so as i mentioned the u.s central banks is publishing data every thursday and friday on the deposits on the borrowing and on the composition of its balance sheet and this is something that normally gets overlooked on a weekly basis given that um, these tier one data releases like inflation, uh, PMIs and labor market data is much more important for markets. But again, as we have shifted from inflation being the main driver of markets to recession 
and the banking crisis being the main driver, these weekly data points have become more watched by market participants. And in my opinion, um, again, I've laid out what the cause, what the primary cause was for the banking crisis, which was it was mainly a security issue with smaller banks, and it was also an interest rate um, factor because with the US central bank raising interest rates by around 475 basis points in the last 12 months or so, um, investors at small banks and depositors didn't really benefit from these increased interest rates because the interest rate on a normal savings or checking account in, in a smaller bank has basically been stagnant over the last 12 months. In comparison, investing in a normal money market fund that is just purely tracking government bonds has given you around 4.5% return on a yearly basis. So there's, well, there was no, not really a reason for these investors that are flexible with their capital to stay at these smaller banks and not benefit from high interest rates. So even before the crisis began, investors started pouring their money into money markets funds. And this is why assets under management of US money market funds has increased to 5 trillion US dollars and almost um, an all time high. So this was the first thing that was kind of the problem. And then this deposit flight that was caused by interest rates has been obviously accelerated by the security risks that investors faced with smaller banks because with the collapse of free commercial banks in the US, especially the larger ones, which was the Signature and the Silicon Valley Bank, some of the investors feared that their um, deposits above 250,000 US dollars, which are not secured by the FDIC, would be lost if other major commercial banks would lose. And this is why they switched, um, even disregarding the interest rate differential, they started pouring money out of smaller banks to these money market funds and especially larger banks. So in my opinion, the first step that the Fed did to contain the crisis they already have done, which is, again, first of all, um, go in line with the FDIC and try to stabilize this um, deposit flight, which they did with these emergency lending facilities and in uh, securing also deposits uh, above 250,000 US dollars. And the second thing that some market participants have mentioned is that the uh, Fed would have to cut rates to close this divergence between what investors are getting at money market funds and what they're getting at smaller banks. But I feel like this is kind of missing the issue because the the security risk or the security factor has much more weight on smaller banks than the interest rate differential. Um, so again, well, looking at this weekly data, we are seeing that markets have perceived the crisis as idiosyncratic, not as systematic, and that markets are now starting to focus a bit more on kind of the macroeconomic data. If we see the usage of the emergency lending facilities continue to be extremely elevated, if commercial banks continue to use these emergency facilities, then markets will start to think that maybe there is something more to the crisis than we are currently seeing. And this, I feel like, would be a bad sign. And this is why, again, we are staying data dependent, and the data released Thursday and Friday every week will be market moving in the next couple of months. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for that, Boris. Um, we have got another question coming uh, related to the pound, so I'll, I'll take this one. Why the sudden uplift in the pound over the last week or two? Um, there's been several reasons for this um, in the presentation, covered quite a few, um, but the first is, is the resilience of the UK economy. Recession fears in the UK have receded, uh, and that's because of a strong consumer spending and expectations and that's bolstered bets of the Bank of England um, raising interest rates. As I mentioned, I think um, the, that 25 basis point hike in May is now considered most likely. Uh, markets are pricing a 75% chance of that happening and uh, a 43% chance of yet another hike after that to 5% by August. Now you compare that to what the markets are pricing for the Fed, where rate cuts are expected from July, and this is one of the key arguments for the rise in, in sterling dollar. But I think um, a second reason for, for the large shift that we've seen most recently is that um, prior to that, currency volatility hadn't really captured what had been happening in the, the rates market, i.e. with the, the banking sector stress, we saw that the, the volatility in, in fixed income, as Boris mentioned, US rate expectations plunged, but the dollar didn't actually weaken as much as you'd expect against its peers. 
and that was because of its safe haven um, appeal. So investors were still buying dollars in a, in a risk averse climate. Um, however, now we're seeing that risk appetite improve thanks to uh, this banking um, term more being more idiosyncratic, as Boris mentioned, contained to the US. And at the same time, those US rate expectations still remain much lower than they were at the start of last month. So there's this combination of monetary policy divergences and risk sentiment that started to filter through to um, the, the currency markets in a bigger way. And the pound has capitalized on that. We also need to remember that the pound is classed as a, a more risk sensitive currency as well, meaning that it tends to appreciate with riskier assets like equities. And so the rise in the pound dollar rate has been in tandem with the rise in global equities that we've seen. Um, a third reason I thought I'd mention is quite interesting. Um, it, it's a seasonality trends as well. So the pound does often outperform this time of the year, and especially in April. And that's because of increasing um, in income, income and capital. And that's driven by uh, dividend payments to British shareholders from foreign companies and other investment inflows um, to mark the start of the UK financial year. And historically, sterling has strengthened in previous Aprils, even during episodes of financial instability or political risk. So this helps boost the conviction of this seasonality study. But as I mentioned in my presentation, this traction to the upside for the pound might start to wane from here, given the huge 20% rally in five months that we've already seen. Got a few more questions in uh, recession risks. Um, Boris, maybe you want to cover the, the global element of that and then I can um, do a UK specific one. Yeah, for sure. Um, so again, talking about the global outlook, um, we have kind of these three main growth drivers, which are China, especially, and then Asia more broadly. We have Europe um, and then we have the US. And we would say that our base case is still for the US to fall in a recession in the third quarter of this year. Um, again, based on the assumption that had, um, these leading indicators and survey-based indicators are still suggesting that the weakness of the consumer in the labor market, which we up to this date did not see, uh, will materialize will materialize going going into Q2 and Q3, and this should um, put pressure on the labor market and especially on economic growth. It should, however, remain quite shallow as the majority of these interest rate hikes are already behind us and especially if the fed really starts cutting rates by the end of this year this should probably at least help sentiment on markets and then uh, as a leading indicator starts kind of um, a new business cycle in 2024. for the europe um, we are a bit more pessimistic in the short term but more optimistic in the medium term so for germany for example the hard data that we have got recently in terms of re uh, retail sales exports and industrial production points to a continued recession not only in q4 that we uh, got but also in q1 which are officially defined a recession so um, in the short term we stay uh, a bit more pessimistic on a global outlook than before, especially because the Chinese reopening that was hailed as one of the key drivers of growth in 2023, uh, 2023 has not materialized, um, especially because the Chinese government has been more prone to weigh in on the debate of financial stability versus economic growth. Um, and they're trying to balance these two risks, which obviously leads to stimulus being less um, uh, of a growth story than we would have hoped for so again in the medium term uh, we are still a bit more pessimistic on, on the global outlook but it will definitely depend on as i said how much banking uh the these these banking um the banking sector in the us tightens lending conditions if we see a significant tightening then this would obviously be a down uh world pressure on the global economy thanks boris um and similar situation for from the uk economic perspective as well um a, a bit of a, a mixture of the two i mean we do anticipate a shallow recession from the uk still but um i'm sure everyone's heard that there's been a bit more upbeat uh, forecast release in, in terms of uk avoiding recession this year um at the back end of of uh, of last year we saw a revi a revision upwards of, of the fourth quarter gdp results for the uk um and the monthly gdp came in um, stronger than expected um, last week as well. So and the hard data has actually been coming out better than expected. And as I mentioned in the presentation, the soft data in terms of expectations, consumer and both business 
um, have been improving as well. So there's definitely signs of resilience, uh, the UK economy, um, but still it's very dependent um, on, on the global economic outlook as well. As Boris mentioned, if the US um, does enter a recession, then it's going to drag on the whole global economy and, and the UK is unlikely um, to, to avoid that, that risk as well. Um, there has been one question come in um, uh, related to uh, uh, an options product in terms of a participator. I'm not going to go into detail around that. Uh, a corporate hedging manager will cover that off in greater detail. Uh, it's related to um, where a re realistic baseline might be set for a participator for a certain US dollar. But rather than going into the details of the product, um, I'd, I'd rather cover the actual um, the, the question itself in relation to the um, exchange rate in terms of the baseline. And as I mentioned in the presentation, the current levels that we've seen on sterling dollar, we're at a 10-month high. We've risen 20% over the last five months. And as we've seen over the last five years or so, the trading range and the, and the average rate of this exchange rate has been dropping um, considerably. It doesn't mean to say that it's going to continue but if you look at it from that wider lens, from um, zooming out a bit and looking at the historical averages, um, you might think that the current levels, 125, um, are attractive to your business. But again, it depends on your tolerance, your risk appetite, um, and what that kind of rate uh, means for your business. And if it does continue to go higher, will it hurt your business? Or will, if the rate continues to fall, will that hurt your business more? I think are the main um, questions to answer there. But um, as I mentioned, you can bring that up with your corporate hedging managers to, to cover in greater detail. Um, I think that's it for, for questions. Um, I think we've covered a few there. Unless anyone else has any more they want to, um, to, to submit over the next a few seconds. Um, but with that, I'm going to respect the time. I know we've got a, a few more um, over the, uh, we've, we've got a few more minutes in time uh, in the bank, but um, just to give everyone some time back, I, I think I'll, I'll just finish off with a few final marks, remarks um, that whatever email address that you use to register for the webinar, you'll automatically receive the recording within 24 hours from the email address at Currency Convo. And if you need the slides, you can contact us via the details on this um, next page here or, or reach out to your um, manager or account manager at, at Convera. So thanks again to our speakers, Boris, uh, myself, Brendan will we'll get his piece um, and send it over to you, um, as I mentioned in the recording. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to you joining our next webinar. Remember, this is a monthly series, so the next one will be in early May. And our hope here is that with this consistent access to insights, um, more informed international trade and, and payment strategies, hopefully lead to, to better financial outcomes for your business. So please do take some time to complete our exit survey provide some feedback and any recommendations for the for any other insight you'd like to hear um, about from us in the future. So thanks again, wishing you all the best and good luck.